Charlie Takes His Shot, How Charlie Sifford Broke the Color Barrier in Golf by Nancy Chernin and pictures by John Joven. Charlie positioned the golf club. Someone was coming. If anyone saw him, he'd be in trouble. He pulled back the club and swung. Then he ran to hide. Charlie's ball soared pretty as a bird, piercing the blue sky at dusk. It wasn't the shot he wanted. He didn't have the time for the shot he wanted, but he grinned as his ball dove and raced on the green, skidding close to the hole. From the moment he grasped a golf club, Charlie knew he was born to play. It wasn't long before he could strike the ball farther and truer than anyone on the course near his home in Charlotte, North Carolina. But it was the 1930s and only white people were allowed to compete on the private green. So Charlie became a caddy. He lugged heavy bags of clubs while he dreamed of the day he could show off his shots for everyone to see. He studied how players gripped their clubs when they straightened and bent their legs and elbows. When Charlie grew older, all that practice helped him win tournaments black players organized for themselves on public courses. Charlie wanted his shot at Professional Golfers Association of America tournaments too, but those tournaments were held in private clubs that only allowed white players. No one would give him a chance to play. Then in 1947, he watched Jackie Robinson become the first black player in Major League Baseball. Fans taunted Jackie and told him to go back to the cotton fields. One of his teammates switched teams to avoid playing with him. But Jackie didn't quit or lose his temper. Quietly yet powerfully, he helped his team win by out hitting and outrunning every opponent. Within a year, Jackie's teammates and fans of every race cheered for him. Could Charlie do the same for golf? In 1948, over a round of golf, Charlie got a chance to ask Jackie Robinson himself. The baseball star thought about the question. It's going to be awfully tough, Charlie, Jackie said finally. He was right. On the golf courses where PGA tournaments were played and players were white, the fans were white, and the sponsors were white, only the caddies were black. Jackie's teammates came around when he proved his talent, but Charlie wouldn't have teammates. Golf is one person against another. Jackie warned Charlie that people would threaten him and call him ugly names. Charlie clenched his fist around his club. He wasn't sure he could stand for that. But Jackie told him if he stayed calm and didn't give up, he could open a door for others. Quote, nobody can do it but you, Jackie said. Long after Jackie left, Charlie thought about his words. It was gonna be tough, but if nobody could do it but Charlie, then Charlie was going to have to do it. He put all his efforts into golfing, driving from New York to California and several states in between for tournaments. He became a pro, which meant that he was committed to earning his living from golf, even if some years he didn't earn much at all. He won the National Negro Open so many times they told him to just keep the trophy. In 1957, he won $2,000 in a tournament, enough money to help him buy a house. But no matter how well Charlie played, he couldn't get his chance at the big PGA tournaments. That's because the PGA had a Caucasian-only clause in their constitution, which said their members had to be white. America was slowly tearing down the walls that kept people apart. Jackie broke the color barrier in Major League Baseball in 1947. Earl Lloyd did the same for the National Basketball Association in 1950. A Supreme Court decision led to the integration of public schools in 1954. But in 1959, the Caucasian-only clause remained in golf, and Charlie couldn't figure out a way to change it. One day, he picked up the New York Post and read a powerful column about how the PGA should let Charlie play. It was written by Jackie Robinson. People started buzzing about what Jackie said. Suddenly, Charlie felt hopeful. In the fall of 1959, Charlie played a man who wasn't a good golfer, but Stanley Mosk was a good lawyer and a good man. They were playing at the Hillcrest Country Club in Los Angeles where Jewish golfers like Stanley had built their own club years ago when they hadn't been welcomed elsewhere. Stanley whistled at Charlie's shots as they flew, skittered and sank into cups. He asked Charlie why one of the best golfers he'd ever seen wasn't playing on the PGA Tour. 
because of this Caucasian clause in their constitution, Charlie told them. You mean to tell me they actually have that written down as a rule? Stanley, who was not only a lawyer, but the Attorney General of California, couldn't believe how unfair that was. He promised Charlie he'd fight for his right to play. It took two years of letters and arguments with the PGA, but Stanley's efforts got the Caucasian-only clause removed in 1961. Charlie became the first black player on the PGA Tour. Still, Charlie's battles weren't over. Hotels where other players stayed wouldn't rent him a room. Clubs where the tournaments were held wouldn't let him eat with the other players, change in their locker rooms, or use their bathrooms. Once a stranger called him and said, quote, you'd better not bring yourself out to our golf course if you know what's good for you. Another time when he went to putt his ball, someone kicked it far away. Charlie kept going. He practiced his swing. He studied courses to figure out the right club and angle for each shot. And he tried to close his ears to the jeers of people who didn't want him there. Then, six years after Charlie had joined the PGA Tour, he noticed something different about the crowd at a tournament in Hartford, Connecticut. For the first time, no one was rooting against him. Swing, putt, sink, hole by hole, he kept advancing. On the final hole, Charlie positioned the golf club. But Charlie rushed the way he had long ago when someone was about to chase him away. Thunk! The ball fell down, down, down into a sand trap. It would be a tough, if not impossible, shot. To Charlie's surprise, he heard encouraging murmurs. The crowd wanted him to win. They believed he could win. Suddenly, Charlie believed too. He took out his wedge, closed his eyes, and swoosh! This time, the ball flew high, fluttered, and landed softly four feet from the cup. He putted, clink! The crowd roared and clapped for 15 minutes. Charlie wiped his wet eyes. He had won $20,000. It felt like a million. Charlie did it. He had opened a door for others. Now Charlie played golf the way he'd dreamed since he was little, showing off his shots for all to see. And now it was possible for everyone who loved the game to play and hear cheers from the crowd. The End <laughs>